the sudden interest of his prosaic uncle into this world of wizardry and horror that had haunted him without interruption now for two days and two nights had the immediate effect of giving the affair an entirely new aspect. The sound of that crisp, hello, my boy, and what's up now, and the grasp of that dry and vigorous hand introduced another standard of judgment. A revulsion of feeling washed through him. He realized he had let himself go rather badly. He even felt vaguely ashamed of himself. The native hard-headedness of his race reclaimed him. And this doubtless explains why he found it so hard to tell the group round the fire everything. He told enough, however, for the immediate decision to be arrived, and that a relief party must start at the earliest possible moment, and that Simpson, in order to guide it capably, must first have food, and above all, sleep. Dr. Cathcart, observing the lad's condition, more shrewdly than his patient knew, gave him a very slight injection of morphine. For six hours, he slept like the dead. From the description carefully written out afterwards by the student of divinity, it appears that the account he gave to the astonished group omitted sundry vital and important details. He declares that, with his uncle's wholesome, matter-of-fact countenance staring him in the face, he simply had not had the courage to mention them. Thus, all the search party gathered, it would seem, was that Defago had suffered in the night an acute and inexplicable attack of mania, and had imagined himself called by someone or something, and had plunged into the bush, after it without food or rifle, where he must die a horrible and lingering death by cold and starvation unless he could be found and rescued in time. In time, moreover, meant at once. In the course of the following day, however, they were off by seven, leaving Punk in charge with instructions to have food and fire always ready. Simpson found it possible to tell his uncle a good deal more of the story's true inwardness, without divining that it was drawn out of him, as matter of fact, by a very subtle form of cross-examination. By the time they reached the beginning of the trail, where the canoe was laid up against the return journey, he had mentioned how Defago spoke vaguely of something he called a windigo, how he cried in his sleep, how he imagined an unusual scent about the camp, and had betrayed other symptoms of mental excitement. He also admitted the bewildering effect of that extraordinary odor upon himself, pungent and acrid like the odor of lions. And by the time they were within an easy hour of Fifty Island water, he had let slip the further fact, a foolish avowal of his own hysterical condition as he felt afterwards, that he had heard the vanished guide call for help. He admitted the singular phrases used, for he simply could not bring himself to repeat the preposterous language. Also, while describing how the man's footsteps in the snow had gradually assumed an exact miniature likeness, of the animal's plunging tracks, he left out the fact that they measured a wholly incredible distance. It seemed a question, nicely balanced between individual pride and honesty, what he should reveal and what suppress. He mentioned the fiery tinge in the snow, for instance, yet shrank from telling that body in bed had been partly dragged out of the tent. With the net result that Dr. Cathcart, adroit psychologist that he fancied himself to be, had assured him clearly enough exactly where his mind, influenced by loneliness, bewilderment, and terror had yielded to the strain and invited delusion. While praising his conduct, he managed at the same time to point out to where, when, and how his mind had gone astray. He made his nephew think himself finer than he was by judicious praise, yet more foolish than he was by minimizing the value of that evidence. Like many other materialists, that he is. He lied cleverly on the basis of insufficient knowledge, because the knowledge supplied seemed to be his own particular intelligence inadmissible. The spell of those terrible solitudes, he said, cannot leave my mind untouched. Any mind, that is, possessed of the higher imaginative qualities. It is worked upon you exactly as it worked upon my own, when I was your own age. The animal that haunted your little camp was undoubtedly a moose, for the belling of a moose may sometimes have a very particular quality of sound. The colored appearance of the big tracks were obviously a defect of vision in your own eyes, produced by excitement. The size and stretch of the tracks we shall prove when we come to them. But the hallucination of an audible voice, of course, is one of the commonest forms of delusion due to mental excitement. An excitement, my dear boy, perfectly excusable, and let me add, wonderfully controlled by you under the circumstances. For the rest, I'm bound to say, you've acted with splendid courage, for the terror of feeling oneself lost in the wilderness is nothing short of awful. And, had I been in your place, I don't for a moment believe I would have behaved with one quarter of your wisdom and decision. The only thing that I found uncommonly difficult to explain is that damned odor. It made me feel sick, I assure you, declared his nephew. 
positively dizzy. His uncle's attitude of calm omniscience, merely because he knew more psychological formula, made him slightly defiant. It was so easy to be wise in the explanation of an experience one had not personally witnessed. A kind of desolate and terrible odor is the only way I can describe it, he concluded, glancing at the features of the quiet, unemotional man beside him. I can only marvel, was the reply, that under the circumstances, it did not seem to you even worse. The dry words Simpson knew hovered between the truth and his uncle's interpretation of the truth. And so at last they came to the little camp and found the tent still standing, the remains of the fire, and the piece of paper pinned to a stake beside it, untouched. The cache, poorly contrived by inexperienced hands, however, had been discovered and opened by muskrats, mink, and squirrel. The matches lay scattered about the opening, but the food had been taken to the last crumb. Well, fellers, he ain't here, exclaimed Hank loudly after his fashion, and that's as sartain as the coal supply down below. But where he's got to this time is about as uncertain as the trade in crowns in the other place. The presence of a divinity student with no barrier to his language at such a time, though for the reader's sake, it may be severely edited. I propose, he added, that we start out at once and hunt for him like hell. The gloom of Trafago's probable fate oppressed the whole party with a sense of dreadful gravity the moment they saw the familiar signs of recent occupancy. Especially the tent, with the bed of balsam branches still smoothed and flattened by the pressure of his body, seemed to bring his presence near to them. Simpson, feeling vaguely as if the world was somehow at stake, went about explaining the particulars in a hushed tone. He was much calmer now, though overwearied with the strain of his many journeys. His uncle's method of explaining, explaining away, rather, the details still fresh in the haunted memory helped, too, to put ice upon his emotions. And that's the direction he ran off in, he said to his two companions, pointing in the direction where the guide had vanished that morning in the grey dawn. Straight down there he ran like a deer, in between the birch and the hemlock. Hank and Dr. Cothgard exclaimed glances. And it was about two miles down there, in a straight line, continued the other, speaking with something of the former terror in his voice, that I followed his trail to the place where it stopped, dead and where you heard him callin' and caught the stench and all the rest of the wicked entertainment, cried Hank, with a volubility that betrayed his keen distress. And where your excitement overcame you to the point of producing illusions, added Dr. Cathcart under his breath, yet not so low that his deaf you did not hear it. It was early in the afternoon, for they had travelled quickly, and there were still good two hours of daylight left. Dr. Cathcart and Hank lost no time in the beginning of the search, but Simpson was too exhausted to accompany them. They would follow the blazed mark on the trees, and where possible, his footsteps. Meanwhile, the best thing he could do was to keep a good fire going, and rest. But after something like three hours' search, the darkness already down, the two men returned to camp with nothing to report. Fresh snow had covered all signs, and though they had followed the blazed trees to the spot where Simpson had turned back, they had not discovered the smallest indication of a human being, and for that matter, of an animal. There were no fresh tracks of any kind, the snow lay undisturbed. It was difficult to know what was best to do, though in reality there was nothing more they could do. They might stay and search for weeks without much chance of success. The fresh snows destroyed their only hope, and they gathered round the fire for supper, a gloomy and despondent party. The facts, indeed, were sad enough, for Defago had a wife at Rat Portage, and his earnings were the family's sole means of support. Now that the whole truth, and all its ugliness, was out, it seemed useless to deal in further disguise or pretense. They talked openly of the facts and probabilities. It was not the first time, even in the experience of Dr. Cathcart, that a man had yielded to the singular seduction of the solitudes and gone out of his mind. Defago, moreover, was predisposed to something of that sort, for he had already had a touch of melancholia in his blood, and his fiber was weakened by bouts of drinking that often lasted for weeks at a time. Something on this trip, one might never know precisely what, had sufficed to push him over the line, that was all. And he had gone, gone off into the great wilderness of trees and lakes to die by starvation and exhaustion. The chances against him finding camp again were overwhelming. The delirium that was upon him would also doubtless have increased, and it was quite likely that he might do violence to himself, and so hasten his cruel fate. Even while they talked, indeed, the end had probably come. On the suggestion of Hank, his old pal, however, they proposed to wait a little longer, and devote the whole of the following day, from dawn to darkness, the most systematic search they could devise. They would divide the territory between them. They discussed their plan in great detail. 
all that men would do, they would do. And meanwhile, they talked about the particular form in which the singular panic of the wilderness had made its attack upon the mind of the unfortunate guide. Hank, though familiar with the legend in general outline, obviously did not welcome the turn the conversation had taken. He contributed little, though that little was illuminating, for he admitted that a story ran over all this section of country, to the effect that several Indians had seen the Windigo along the shores of Fifty Island Water in the fall of last year, and this was the true reason of Defago's disinclination to hunt there. Hank doubtless felt that he had in a sense helped his old pal to death by over-persuading him. When an Indian goes crazy, he explained, talking to himself more than the others, it seemed. It's always put that he's seen the Windigo, and poor old Defago was superstitious down to the very heels. And then Simpson, feeling the atmosphere more sympathetic, told over again the full story of his astonishing tale. He left out no details this time. He mentioned his own sensations and gripping fears. He only omitted the strange language used. But Defago surely had already told you all the details of the Wendigo legend, my dear fellow, insisted the doctor. I mean, he had talked about it, and thus put into your mind the ideas with which your excitement afterwards developed. Whereupon Simpson again repeated the facts. Defago, he declared, had barely mentioned the beast. He, Simpson, knew nothing of the story, and so far as he remembered, he had never even read about it. Even the word was unfamiliar. Of course he was telling the truth, and Dr. Cathcart was reluctantly compelled to admit the singular character of the whole affair. He did not do this in words so much as in manner, however. He kept his back against a good, stout tree. He poked the fire into the blaze the moment it showed signs of dying down. He was quicker than any of them to notice the least sound in the night about them. A fish jumping out of the lake, a twig snapping in the bush, the dropping of occasional fragments of frozen snow from the branches overhead where the heat loosened them. His voice too changed a little, in quality, becoming a shade less confident, lower also in tone. Fear, to put it plainly, hovered close about the little camp, and though all three would have been glad to speak of other matters, the only thing that seemed to be able to discuss was this, the source of their fear. They tried other subjects in vain. There was nothing to say about them. Hank was the most honest of the group. He said next to nothing. He never once, however, turned his back to the darkness. His face was always to the forest, and when wood was needed, he didn't go further than necessary to get it. <laughs>